I'm sorry I have the sniffles this evening. I'll do my best to not let it be a distraction, even though it's distracting me. Okay, today is October the 29th, 2020. We have another opportunity to grow in grace and knowledge, and to do that we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so... Let's have a few moments of prayer where we can name any unconfessed sins to God and we will be ensured of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for who you are, omnipotent, omniscient, full of grace and mercy, and yet you are righteous and just. And we're so thankful for your immutability that you change not. The truth does not change. Everything on this earth may change, but you do not, neither does the truth. And we're thankful that we can understand the full realm of doctrine because of your grace. It's not our intellect. It's not our education. It's our eagerness to grow in your word, to learn more about you, how to trust you, all the things that we need to do every day. And we thank you for this time that we can come together as a royal family to study your word. And so we pray that you will enlighten us as we do that this evening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read something quickly before we get started. This came from the Family Research Center. I don't know if you know about them, but they are a Christian organization that is striving uh, to be righteous in a fallen world. It says, Dear Mike, with the critical 2020 elections just days away, it is urgent that I update you on the status of the Terrible Equality Act. How many of you know anything about the Equality Act? Anybody? <laughs> well, that's pretty much across the board. It's a detestable, wicked uh, bill, I guess you would say at this point, that the House has been trying to push through for a long time. He says... A one-stop, this is, he's describing the Equality Act. A one-stop shop for the LGBTQ lobbies and their radical, radical wish list that mandates anti-life, anti-family, and anti-faith agenda on Americans. The bill overhauls our federal civil rights framework to mandate special privileges for sexual orientation, and gender identity, leaving many Americans to suffer the consequences, including children, women, teachers, medical professionals, and Bible-believing Americans like you and me. It was passed last summer by Nancy Pelosi-led House and now awaits action in the Senate. Democratic nominee Joe Biden says that if he wins on Tuesday, it will be the first thing I ask to be done. But regardless of who wins the election, you and I have seen over and over again how the left introduces shocking bills, then pounds away through their media allies until sooner or later the perverse is deemed normal 
and opponents are declared haters and intolerable bigots. Chances are, most Americans, you and your neighbors haven't heard of the Equality Act lately. That's by design, knowing how horrified average Americans are when they learn what's in the bill. The national news media focuses instead on the pandemic of racial unrest. As I contact you today, radical activists are hard at work to win this election because they are counting on Biden presidency and a newly elected Senate to ram it through. We must defeat this terrible bill, encourage every Christian and conservative voter to make their voices heard at the ballot box. The Equality Act is one of the most egregious attacks on religious liberty ever attempted by the Democratic Party, not to mention the threat that it will pose to the privacy and the safety of women and children. Yes, that's Tony Parkins with the uh, Family Research Council. So, <clears throat> this is their pattern. They just don't quit. And they have the media acolytes with them. I, I just have to bite my tongue not to go on a rant right now about what I think about our media. <clears throat> I will say this. I think you know it already. They're God-hating traitor, uh, traitors. And that's all I'll say, but that's quite a bit. That's all right. Thank you, Pete. Okay, we're going to review very quickly where we started on our points that I gave Tuesday night. And I'll put them on the board so you can see them as we go. This is what precipitated them, was 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, which is one of the verses that demonstrate biblically that homosexuals are not born that way. It's not an immutable orientation. It's a choice. I think, I think Pete makes more noise than the ice, than the ice dumps. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not giving him a bad time. He's bringing me water, ice water at that. Okay, so if you'll look at this, we'll just read through this one time. I've been over it several times. Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? People read that first sentence and they think, oh, this is unbelievers that are going to go to hell because of their sins. It's not even anywhere close to that, but that's what most people and even a lot of pastors and scholars will go there, and that's not what the text says. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers. Thank you, Pete shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's the second time that those who indulge in these things and are identified by their sins are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Of course, that does not mean they're not going to be there. And by the way, I've already said it enough times, you should know by now, he is not referring to unbelievers here. He was referring to believers. Believers can do all of these sins and do them regularly to where they were identified by that. So the unrighteous is, in this context here, is referring to believers. They will be in heaven, but they will not inhabit, I mean, excuse me, inherit heaven. They will, have, will not have rewards, crowns, opportunities, all the things that those who grow in grace and knowledge will have. Verse 11, and such were some of you. Now that line right there demonstrates that these, some of these people were all, all the things or some of the things that's listed in the list and homosexuals are listed in the list so it means some of them were 
homosexuals, but they were not anymore. So that cannot be an immutable orientation, biblically speaking. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. Now we'll go through these, and I hope you will forgive me for going fairly fast, but this is, after all, a review. First of all, we must recognize that Paul was addressing believers in verses 9 through 11, which most people think they are not. There may be some that think, well, maybe they're believers, but if they're believers, then they lose their salvation, which is, of course, impossible. Subpoint A, the unrighteous in verse 9 is not referring to unbelievers, but to disobedient believers who will be present in the kingdom of God, but have diminished opportunity. There is a price to disobey God regularly and commit these sins. But it's not loss of salvation, and it's not that you're going to hell for them either. Subpoint B, there is a cost for disobeying God and willfully indulging in sin, but it's not losing eternal salvation. Point number two, if anyone would be denied access into heaven because of sins he committed, then Christ's death on the cross was useless if we are still held accountable for our sins. In other words, he failed on the cross if we are held accountable for our sins. God is just, and the law of double jeopardy would kick into gear if if God held Jesus Christ responsible for our sins and then held us responsible for them again, then that is unjust. And, of course, that will never happen because our God is perfectly just. Furthermore, it would also mean that he lied when he said it is finished on the cross. A lot of people think, well, Christ did his part, now it's our time to do our part. That's hogwash. It's finished. Point number three, the fact is no one goes to the lake of fire because of their sins because Jesus Christ paid for the sins of the world. And we have a few scriptures here. If you don't have these jotted down or if you don't know them, I would say, I would suggest you go in your Bible somewhere where there's a blank space. And I only have three or four of these here, but they're very important because there are a lot of people that will challenge the fact that people do not go to hell for their sins. The first one is 2 Corinthians 5.19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. He wasn't counting their trespasses against them because he had already paid for their sins. 1 John 2.2. 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. First, uh, John 1, 29. The next day he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him, this is when he was going to be baptized, and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Prior to that time, the animal sacrifices would just put a lid on sin. It would cover sin. But the true Lamb of God would take away the sins of the world because he had paid for them. First John 4, 14. And we have beheld and bear witness that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Point four. Verses 9 through 11 are about believers who were kind, the kind of people described in the list who would be disinherited at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, when I say things like that, if I wasn't teaching my own flock here, I would have to stop and explain all these things. But I don't think I need to do that with you because you know what the judgment seat of Christ is, you know what happens there, and you know that some are going to be disinherited and embarrassed and shamed, and others are going to be rewarded. Sin has nothing to do with it. For us then, and even for the unbelievers at the great white throne, they are not condemned for their sins either because, again, Christ paid for their sins. So, the ones that are identified by the sins in the list, which are, of course, believers, 
will be disinherited at the judgment seat of Christ, meaning that they would lose their inheriting rights in heaven and will not receive any crowns, reward, decorations, privileges for all eternity. And that's a long time. Yes. Well, we have we we're, what we're doing is going through this. Okay, I can do that. <clears throat> Point number five. We will focus only on those in the list above who are identified as being effeminate and homosexual since that is our topic and we've been on it for about three or four lessons already. And it's because it's such an important topic. Notice that verse 11, Romans chapter, I mean, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 11 starts with these words. And such were some of you. That means that some of the believers were identified as those who were on the list. And of course that would in include in the list, they were homosexuals. They were, but now that has changed. Point seven. There are three, fra uh, <coughs> three phrases that start with the word but that demonstrate that they were no longer practicing former sins. And if you look up here on verse 11, here they are, starting right here. And such were some of you, but you were washed. That's the first but. But you were sanctified, second one. But you were justified, that's the third one. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. So that's the three buts that I'm referring to. What, what point was that? Seven? Yeah, there it is, seven, okay. And so those buts demonstrate that they were no longer practicing the former sins, whatever it was. Whether it was stealing, fornicating, idolatry, they were doing it, but then they were not anymore. Verse eight. It should be noted that if they continued to commit the sins on the list, including homosexuality, they would still be saved, but would receive divine discipline. Point nine. But you were washed. I'm not going to go through all of this because it's technical. I went through it last time. We'll get down here to verse Isaiah, uh, the verse in Isaiah 116. Wash yourself, Cal imperative. Make yourself clean. Remove the evil from your deeds. Hifel imperative. Remove the evil deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Another Cal imperative. All these show that we are commanded, or at least in this case, it was the Israelites were commanded, and by uh, the same holds true for us, God never commands his children to do something that they're unable to do. He enables us to do it. And in all these cases, it starts out with, make yourself clean. Now we know that in an experiential sense, after we sin, we know how to make ourselves clean by acknowledging our sins to God. And that sin is forgiven and we are again in fellowship with God. The relationship is right on track. That's in 1 John 1, 9. Point 10. But you were sanctified. That's a, a passive voice and it means all believers are positionally sanctified at the moment they are saved. This means God set them apart for special blessing. God did that. They received it. The only thing I'll say about uh, when it says you were washed, that is an S middle indicative. The middle voice means the person is the one who does the action of the verb or is affected by their own action. That was not done by, by God. I went into several journals and were looking at scholars and a lot of people that were commenting on this verse and not one of them saw that this was done by the person himself. And they would say, God did this. But it can't be that way when it is in the middle voice. It's the subject. 
And the subject here were the ones who were committing those sins. They, in a, in a um, metaphor sense, metaphorical sense, wash themselves. It doesn't elaborate how they wash themselves, but the point is they were able to do it. It was not that they were had an immutable trait, an immutable orientation. They were able to change. That's the point. And you were sanctified as a passive voice, and then you were justified, the same thing, a passive voice, Every, every believer is justified at the moment of salvation based on the fact that he or she receives the imputation of God's righteousness. Point 12, the Corinthian believers were committing every kind of sins, so Paul was warning them that there are consequences for that, and they had the power to stop it. Why would he be warning them if it was immutable and they couldn't do anything about it anyway? Point 13, this is where we ended last time. Homosexual activity is a sin, which is like any other sin, can be avoided. And I changed that. I didn't change it here, but I changed it on the Internet. I, I like the word resisted more than avoided here. And so if you see that change on the Internet, and I'm going to change it here uh, soon. There are people who, for whatever reason, are sexually attracted to those of the same sex. In order to obey God, they must resist that temptation, just like heterosexual men and women must resist the temptation to have sex with those of the opposite sex who is not their spouse. You don't hear them saying, oh, well, it's an immutable thing. We have a gene. Uh, we have an orientation to that. That will not float. It's simply not biblical and it's not true. So if a person says they're a homosexual and they're striving not to be, then you can say, well, brother, so am I. We're not striving for the same thing, but both of us have to strive. And when I'm weak and when I succumb to temptation, I may be punished. I may uh, be lacking the... the things that God might, might have given me. It's the same thing with them as well. It's just that they don't want to take responsibility for them because they think they have a, what would you call it, a, a punishment-free card. They were born that way. Fourteen, now we're plowing new ground. Yes. Okay. No, that, we're not talking about discipline in heaven. Yeah, but the, the, is, you have, you okay, I've got to straighten this out because if she's thinking this, somebody else might be thinking it as well. The question, if I can repeat it right, was that uh, people are disciplined on earth for uh, disobeying God. And you ask when people get into heaven and they're going to have no rewards, decorations, or privileges, or opportunities, that that's discipline in heaven. There is no discipline in heaven. It's that we make decisions in the here and now that is going to determine what our status is going to be when we get to heaven. Even for the worst believer, they're still, heaven is still going to be phenomenal. But they're going to be a peon for all eternity. And, it, and, and when they get to the judgment seat of Christ, where they're hearing that great accolade, well done, thou good and faithful servant, they're going, Jesus Christ is going to lay out their life, what they did with it, and they're going to be ashamed because they cared nothing about God or his word or Jesus Christ. They were like these heathen that knew information of, about God enough to where they should have submitted to him and believed the gospel, it's, it's, they are going to be peons. And the, the only time that there's going to be this shamefulness or really being uncomfortable is at the judgment seat of Christ. It doesn't carry on into life in heaven because life is wonderful. And the problem is there's so many people that say, well, you know, 
if heaven is such, such a great place, um, I, I don't have to knock myself out in studying the Word and growing in grace and being a mature believer because I'm going to heaven anyway. It's going to be great. But what about the time? In time, what's going to happen? You're going to miss out in time the super grace blessings. You're going to be miserable. You'll make bad decisions. Then God is going to add His punishment to you, divine discipline, maybe to the point of the sin unto death. Then you're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ and be ashamed because God, the perfect uh, Jesus Christ, the perfect judge, is going to bring all this out. And then you're going to go into heaven and you might be handling some kind of uh, heavenly apple cart trying to sell apples in heaven. I don't know what you're going to be doing. But for all eternity, you're not going to have the phenomenal things that you could have. Right. That's, that's my point. <laughs> There's not going to be any sin in heaven. We're not going to have an old sin nature. There's no reason to have discipline. What, what, what my point is, is the things that we choose to do here, like the believers in Corinth that were doing the sins on that list, so much they were, they were identified. That's not sins there. Those are people who are identified for their sin. For if, if, if uh, it says uh, idolaters, those are people who were ongoing getting into idolatry. Fornicators, the, they were the ones that were doing fornicators. You see? Okay. Now we're starting new ground here in point 14. The problem is when someone claims that homosexual activity is not a sin but a mutable orientation that they were born with that they have no control over. Now I've found out as of late that it, all, all homosexuals are not on the same page with this. Some of them say, yes, it was a choice. I choose to do this. I have this uh, lover. I'm in love with him. And there's nothing wrong with love, so I made that choice to to have illicit sex with this person. They wouldn't say it's illicit, illicit, but God does. And so they say, some of them say they're choosing it, and others will say, no, we were born that way. We have no control over it. Point 15. Dr. Neil Whitehead is a research scientist and biochemist from New Zealand, and his wife, Briar Whitehead, is a writer. Dr. Whitehead co-authored a book with his wife entitled, My Genes Made Me Do It. <laughs> He's not talking about blue jeans, by the way. A scientific look at sexual orientation which argues that there is no genetic determinism in regards to homosexuality and that there is abundant documentation that individuals are able to leave homosexuality and become heterosexuals. That's something you don't hear very much of, do you? Do you? It's because the media and the left, the liberals, are doing what they always do or what they've done lately, and that is bury it. They don't want you to know that there are ex-homosexuals. <coughs> Excuse me. Point 16. Another well-known author in the field, Hatterer, who believes in sexual orientation change. He said, I've heard of hundreds of men who went from a homosexual to a heterosexual adjustment on their own. 17. Female homosexuals and male homosexuals. By the way, I think this would probably be the best way to describe this particular group of people. We say homosexuals and lesbians, but actually females are Female homosexuals, they're attracted to the same sex. Anyway, female homosexuals and male homosexuals who leave homosexuality and become ex-homosexuals are often referred to as ex-gays. And the ex-gay movement became well known in the United States in the 1970s. Point 18. Ex-homosexual quotes. Here's one. Homosexuality is death, and I choose life. That's ex-homosexual and ex-gay rights leader Michael Gleitz. I guess it's Gleitzy. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. He was a homosexual gay rights leader at one time, but he, like Hank Williams, saw the light. 
Another quote, I came out of homosexuality after a powerful encounter with Jesus Christ and a desire to serve and obey him. I can say with complete honesty, I never have homosexual desires of any sort, physical or emotional. This is ex-lesbian Yavette Cantu Snyder. <clears throat> now, I don't have any reason to doubt her. I think she's probably telling the truth, but that's not the experience of every homosexual. I'm sure there's homosexuals out there that recognize that this is an abomination to God. They are answerable to God, and they want to stop uh, having this forbidden uh, abomination and being disobeying God. And so I think, they can, well, I don't think, I know that they are able to do it as a believer because now they have the Holy Spirit power. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have his power and he can enable you. But that doesn't mean that the desire or temptations are gone. They may still have those temptations and desires, but that doesn't mean that they have liberty to act upon them any more than we have liberty to act on the temptations that we have. Point 19. So both the Bible and the experience of thousands of ex-homosexuals confirms that homosexuality is a choice, not an immutable orientation. Furthermore, now this is an important point here. I wish it didn't, wouldn't cut in half in the screen, but it is. Furthermore, if homosexuals were born with an immutable orientation towards homosexuality that is irresistible, then God could not be just in condemning homosexual homosexuals to be executed in the Old Testament for indulging in homosexual activity. Now that is a that's a bold statement, but it cannot be any other way. If they are right and it's a immutable orientation and they have no control over it, if that was true, then we have a God that is unjust because the penalty for catching someone in a homosexual act in the Old Testament was execution by stoning to death. That's what God thinks about homosexuality. So God can't be right and the LGBTQ people be right as well. Somebody is not right. I put my chips on God. Point 20. There are many who reject what is stated above, and it's easy to see why. Now, this is a quote from, well, it's not the one I'm thinking about yet, but I'll go ahead and read it. It's from um, Heli Organization Resources Ex-Gays. So here's, it says, if ex-gays exist, this means that people can change their sexual orientation. And there are tens of thousands of them that exist. And this means that the foundation, the homosexual rights movement, the idea that they are born that way and thus cannot help themselves goes right out the window. Their strongest argument simply disappears. If the born that way allegation is debunked, the homosexuals lose their claim to be a protected minority under civil rights law. And what did we start with tonight? The Equality Act that, if passed, will gut the religious rights that are guaranteed us in the First Amendment. And it's the uh, those that are engaged in the LGBT community will have special rights. Not only will ours be taken away and ignored, they will have special rights. And if that does come to the floor and it is passed into law, I can conceive just by uh, common sense what will happen. If you, for instance, would say that homosexuality is a sin, that would be a hate crime and they could put you in jail for it. So if that does go, go to, uh, comes to pass, you'll probably have to be visiting me behind bars one of these days because I'm not going to say otherwise. I'm not going to say that homosexuality is not a sin. 
And yet there's people today that if you say it's a sin, they go ballistic. Point 21. Below is a typical argument from those who support the claim that homosexuals are born that way and there is nothing they can do to change that fact. Now, I'm going to give you the location of this. This is Wikipedia, or, uh, wikipedia.org, ex-gay movement. Now, so I'm going to tell you something. I don't, you may know this already. Whenever you go to Wikipedia, you need to take it with a grain of salt. Because most of what you have there is very liberal. Just like what I'm about to read to you here. Now, if you just need a few facts, that are not uh, in any way controversial, it's fine to go there. But I don't go there unless I'm, I, 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 let me put it this way, I go there with my eyes wide open recognizing that they're not going to give the biblical uh, position. They certainly don't in this. So uh, this is what the Wikipedia has to say if you look up uh, homosexuality. It's a large body of research and global Scientific consensus indicates that being gay, lesbian, or bisexual is compatible with normal mental health and social adjustment. I think their nose just grew about a foot on that one. Because of this major mental health professional, organizations discouraged and caution individuals against attempting to change their sexual orientation to heterosexual and warn that doing so can be harmful. So they're saying that, of course, this first claim saying they have, they're saying that bise bisexual or gay, lesbian or bisexual is compatible with normal mental health and social adjustment. Now if you go and tell them, well, I know what you're saying, but I also know what God says, and God says it's a bondable sin. I don't think they're going to agree with you. And they're even going to the point to say, if you are a homosexual, and you uh, try to become a heterosexual, that the warning you to attempting to do so can be harmful. Harmful to whom? Point 22, to say that homosexual activity is a sin can be dangerous in our neo-pagan society today. Many believers have succumbed to the peer pressure of accepting it and some even celebrate it to their shame. And I'm talking about Christians. It's the, in it the Episcopalians that have open homosexual pastors. And there's others that do as well. We must stand for the truth of God's word no matter what. We must fear God rather than man. We must not see those in the LGBTQ as our enemies, but as those who have believed Satan's lies and desperately need to hear the truth spoken to them in love. So they're not our enemies. Yes, they can. They do great harm to society and spread disease. There's a lot of things that they are a plague to society, but they're doing it because they have believed the satanic lies and they, they know the truth. We know that they know the truth that God is exists, but... Whether they acted upon that or not, I don't know. What is it, Cindy? No need to raise it? Okay. Here's a few verses to su support this. Hebrews 13, 6 says, So that we confidently can say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? We should fear God above all. And any time that we are in a situation to where it's time for us to stand firm for the word, then we are held responsible for doing that, for standing firm for the word. And throughout the world right now and throughout history, people have made stands similar to this and it cost them their life. Could that happen here? Of course it can happen here. We're on that, we're on that track right now. 
going full speed ahead to where there'll be Christian persecution much worse than we have today. We have people who are fined and thrown in jail because they will not bow the knee to Baal and say, well, yeah, I'll, I'll bake a cake for those homosexuals in their wedding and all that. Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is for me. I will not fear what man, what can man do to me. Sounds a lot like the one above it, doesn't it? How much do you fear God? Now the fear isn't the kind of fear that the Muslims has for Allah. They cower in fear because the Quran, to my knowledge, doesn't even have the word love in it. And they're just hoping that if they have any contact with Allah, he's in a good mood. But with us, I mean, they f literally fear that he's going to do something to them that is unjust. We never should have that fear. Our fear should be that we're not being good and faithful servants and that we are going to act on our human viewpoint and be full of mental attitude sins of fear and panic. So essentially what I'm saying is over all this course of these lessons that I've given you regarding uh, homosexuality, we don't want to look like we're better than thou in any way. And if we ever talk to anyone who thinks differently than we do, we should hear them out. And then just ex explain to them, I hear what you said, now please hear what I say because I'm saying, I'm quoting what God says. They may never have even heard this. You may say things they have never heard of before. You might put a little pebble in their shoe and they can't get rid of it. And the Holy Spirit might use them in order to reach thousands of other homosexuals because they were one and they got the truth. They acted on it, just like that woman said. She was a leader and now she is a servant of God. <clears throat> okay, now we're moving on to verse 28. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. I think we should open our Bibles to Romans chapter 1. And I want to get a, a, a little bit more context and just starting here in verse 28. Let's, let's start with verse 24. We'll read up from 24 up to verse 28 to give us the context because it's been a while we were right in the middle of this, and then I got off on this uh, homosexual thing, and now we're going to pull it together. Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Therefore God gave them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. I want you uh, to underline gave them over. It's used three times. It's used here in verse 24, 26, and 28. <clears throat> gave them over means he abandoned them to their own lust, to their own sins. The worst punishment for sin is sin itself. Verse 25. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and serve the, create, the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26. For, the, for this reason God gave them over to degener, degenerating, degrading, excuse me, degrading passions for their women, women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. Everybody tells you it's natural. The Bible says it is unnatural. Verse 27. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural fu function of the women and burned in their desire towards one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own person the due penalty of their error. Now, I didn't have you underline that one. In verse 26, you should have underlined God gave them over to degrading passions. 
And in the same way, also men abandon the natural function of women. But that's not one you're going to underline. That's the, on the dark side. Verse 28, where we're starting now. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Again, that is, gave them over, abandoned them. Those are all verbs. Aorist active indicatives. In a point in time, God is the one that produced the action and it's a reality that he turned from them, he abandoned them. So you see it on the board now, verse 28. It's just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. So we're going to look at, first of all, when I have it in red here, they did not see fit. See fit is in red, and that's what we're going to look at. The Greek word there is dokimazo, D-O-K-I-M-A-Z-O. This is the aorist active indicative. In a point of time, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, it is those who had decided to be disobedient to God. That's the active voice. Indicative of reality. They did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. Dokimanzo means to draw a conclusion about worth, to prove or approve. So you could say they didn't approve any longer the knowledge of God or they didn't think it was worth anything any longer. See fit is dokimanzo. Then the next, the next word here is to acknowledge God any longer. You see this phrase right here? Acknowledge here is one of our old friends. Most of you probably recognize this. It's epinosis. Epinosis. Gnosis is knowledge. Epi means full. So epinosis means full knowledge. This is a dative singular neuter noun. And so here's a, a couple of other versions of the Bible that say it in similar ways that help you understand what's happening here. The NIV says they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. If they did, they would have continued to take it in if they were taking it in to begin with. And then we have the LAB, the Lexham English Bible, says this, they did not see fit to recognize God. That's what happens when you turn your back on God. You turn your back on truth. You want to be independent and do whatever you want to do. Then you don't recognize God anymore. I mean, to, I mean, doesn't mean that you see him, you recognize him. I mean, he's not even in your life. You don't recognize him. You don't care about him. You've already declined him. He's not even thought about in, anymore in your life. Before we go any further, though, I want to show you this. It says, to acknowledge God any longer. You see the any longer there? Those words, any longer, are not found in other translations. I looked at the New King James, the King James. I looked at the uh, English Standard Bible. I looked at the NIV, New International Version. I looked at the Lexham Bible. I looked at the um, Net Bible, New English Translations. I looked at a lot of different translations, and the New American Standard is the only one that has any longer. Now, the reason... That is, that is so because the New American Standard Version comes from a different manuscript than, say, does the author, authorized version, they call it, which is the King James Version or the New King James Version. So what I'm going to do with that is just leave it because I can't say that the New American Standard Version is right and the others are wrong or vice versa. But it does make a difference because if it says they... They did not see fit to acknowledge God. If you say any longer, it means that one time they did. 
And I can't say that that is so. It could be. Maybe there were those who had were did see fit to acknowledge God and they were on course and something happened and uh, so they're not they didn't see fit to acknowledge God any longer but the other ones just leave it as it is so what I'm going to do is just leave it as it is as well I just wanted to point that out to you so I can't say if this is talking about people who had worshiped God maybe they were believers but they got off track that can happen and a person can do any of the sins in in First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine through eleven. They can do any of those sins, and they were doing those sins. See, a lot of people think, "Oh, well, that can't be talking about believers because believers don't believers don't do those kind of things." <laughs> I can't say it with a straight face. Okay, this is what happens prior to one's life going off the rails. And what am I talking about? That they don't see fit to recognize God anymore. That always precedes calamity in the soul. A life going off the rails. The desire to be independent and do anything we want becomes greater than our desire to obey and please God. That is the tipping point. That is when we make a decision. Well... Maybe we've been a believer for a while. Maybe we were taking in doctrine for a while and then we got distracted and the next thing you know, I really want to do this. And you can talk yourself right into it. And that's when you no longer see fit to recognize God or you could say it's no longer worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. God is out of your life. You're not thinking about Him anymore and you don't want to think about Him because if you did, it would be a drag. You might even fear retribution. You might even fear divine discipline, all those things. And you don't want to think about that, so you just put him out of your life. And people think, that works? <laughs> yeah, right. Negative volition and the rejection of God open the floodgates of all the dreadful sins that are in the list that follows. I don't know if you saw in your scripture, in your Bible yet, but once we're through with verse 28, Verse 29 and 30 and 31 are nothing but list of sin. That's a lot of sins there. And we're not only saying that, we're not just limiting this to homosexuality. No matter what your sins are, once you get to that point of negative volition where you reject God, you want him out of your life so you can get on and be independent without God in your life, then all the sins that we're going to be going over in that list is the fallout, the consequence of getting to that point to where your desire to do what you want to do is more important and more strong than your desire to please God. Many believers come to a point over time where they no longer recognize God in their life because they fail to take in Bible doctrine on a regular basis. This does not happen overnight. Gradually, the details of life become more important than our spiritual life and our relationship with the Lord. It's so sad, so sad. You know how many times the Bible tells us to be vigilant, to be alert? It's not just talking about major attacks. It's talking about the everyday grind. Don't let yourself become uh, get to the point to where the things of the world can be more important than the things of God. Because that, when that happens, that's when your train goes off the rails. And what you've actually done is in your own soul made a decision that it's not worthwhile anymore to retain the things of God. And now you're going whole hog into the world. This happens by the millions of Christians. It doesn't have to be a death in the family. It doesn't have to be a major event. All it has to, 
All that has to happen is that you get bored. You get tired of the routine of coming to Bible class and listening, taking notes and doing all this. Some believers do that and, and, and they're just going through the motions. They really don't have a strong relationship with God because they hardly even talk to Him. And they're not intimate with Him by explaining every... There's nothing off limits when you're praying to God. And when you get away from that and you're not supporting your soul, your cardia, your heart, with the, the things of God, they will get less and less important. You don't see it. Gradually this happens, but over a period of a, of a month, six months, a year, and this is, comes on gradually before you know it, boom! You're through with God. You're through with doctrine. I've got bigger things to do. I'm a busy person. I've got a house, I've got kids, I've got a job. I don't have time for all that. And by the way, I've been weaning myself off of that all this time, and God hadn't struck me dead, so it must not be that bad. And they, what happened at the tipping point, they went the wrong way. And they're done with God. And we're talking about born-again believers. Oh, yes, they'll be in heaven. But for all eternity, they're going to miss out on what they could have had. And the things that they're going to miss out on are so wonderful, the Bible can't even, there's not words for them. It says that uh, I has not seen nor ear heard nor even have entered into the mind of man the things that God has for those who love him. And people want to throw that away because they're too busy on earth trying to get ahead or do whatever they want to do. That's the take-home message of these scriptures so far. And we have to be ever vigilant that that doesn't happen to us because it can. We don't see it coming. You've seen it in other people. You've seen it, seen it and you, you, you think, boy, and we, we pray for other people that they will wake up It's not our business to judge them, but it is our business to love them and to pray for them when they start slipping. And if you're a good friend, you might be able to confide in them and say, hey, what's going on with your life? Not in a judgmental way, but I love you and you're, you're off the rails. And it takes love to do that because it might cost your friendship, but you love them enough to, to point it out to them. We're out of time. We will continue next time. This is a good one here. God gave them over to a depraved mind. How many depraved minds are out there? <laughs> oh, I shudder to think of it. But there are some godly people out there that are good and faithful servants. They operate on God's power. So it's not how many they are, it's how much they trust God. Okay, let's close. Father, thank you for this time that we can focus on these things, that we are charging our batteries, our spiritual batteries. We have ammunition not to go out and to berate people, aggravate people, and be obnoxious, but we have the truth on vital issues. And we pray that when we are in a setting where we have the opportunity to impart that knowledge to others, that we do it wisely. Not arguing, just simply stating the facts and that these are the facts from God. We pray that you will help us to be bold and not shy away. The Holy Spirit will surely take up the slack and we are just the mouthpiece as you speak through us to those who so desperately need it and they are by the legions out there. So we want to be those vessels of honor that you can use and be good and faithful servants. So we thank you for this. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.